been shown that maximum performance, maximum achievements occur at the border of support and challenge, the border of the pride and shame, the authentic self which sits in the center. This particular topic is how your perceptions of success can interfere with your growth. Now, most people would immediately think, well, wait a minute, no, I want success, but I'm, um, I'm going to challenge that. It was Keo who headed up Coca-Cola Company that used to be on the board of Berkshire Hathaway with Bart Warren Buffett. And he made a statement that really impacted me way back 30-something years ago. And that was that I'm leery of people that think they're successful. They're usually on their way down. So I want you to uh, wrap your head around a new idea. Anytime you perceive yourself successful, you tend to depurpose and tend to allow yourself by the licensing effect to do lower priority activities. You've heard the statement, I got so successful, I stopped doing what got me there. And the second you think you're successful, you get proud. And pride is a, an exaggeration of self. It's not an authentic self where you actually excel and grow, but it's an exaggerated self. And you depurpose because you go off on lower priority things. You give yourself permission to splurge <clears throat> or relax because you think you're successful. And then on the other side of the equation, if you think you have failed or you are going backwards, instead of depurposing, it can repurpose you. It can make you stop and look at what is really priority and I better get back to priority. And this is humbling. And this makes you go to higher priority things. See, the idea that you're successful, you tend to go to lower priority things by the licensing effect and depurposing impact. And if you feel like you're a failure, you tend to go to higher priority things and repurpose yourself and go back to what's really important to you. If you look in your life, you can see this is not uncommon. You've seen this. So the idea of success can interfere with a stable uh, focus. Now, let me um, give you a little story that I think you might find interesting. And you might just apply this little exercise. Many years ago, this would have been 30, woo, nine years ago, 38, nine years ago, 40 years ago almost. When I was in practice, I, um, if I had a big day, saw lots of patients, collected a lot of money, I sometimes would get a bit puffed up and think, wow. And I would sometimes exaggerate myself and puff myself up and think I was somebody special. And I noticed that when I would go home, when I was puffed up, I noticed that my spouse, my marriage partner, was inevitably humbling me. <laughs> you know, in those days, I was pretty naive and I still was into the idea of being positive, positive, positive all the time. And I didn't realize that her role of being the critical, challenging one at that time was not toxicity. It was actually a caring response to get me back into equilibrium because I was puffed up because I was exaggerating what I had done. I also noticed that when I had a really low day and really had a, whoa, what a day, I would come home and my spouse would massage my back or go out of her way or, I mean, it was amazing. She had this knack for knowing if I was down, she would lift me up. If I was up, she'd bring me down. It's kind of like if you're from Australia, they have a tall poppy syndrome. If you're cocky and successful, they try to bring you down. And if you're down and out, they try to lift you up and support you with a doll. So I'm a firm believer that nature, our society, our friends, colleagues, or whatever, our loved ones are always trying to get us authentic. When we puff ourselves up with thinking we're successful, we're not authentic. When we're beating ourselves up and think we're not successful, we're failures, we're not authentic. When we're actually on a mission and centered 
and not exaggerating ourselves or minimizing ourselves, but just appreciative of the opportunity to be of service. We center ourselves. So when I was really up, I noticed my spouse would nail me, deflate me. And when I was down, she'd inflate me. And at first I thought, again, she's toxic. She doesn't want me to be up. And the idea of trying to be positive all the time. There was a book called Toxic Relationships, and it was talking about it. And I would not recommend the book because it misleads people extensively. It makes people live in the fantasy that people are always supposed to be positive and supportive. And that is a delusion. If you are challenging somebody's values and you're cocky, they're designed to bring you back down into equilibrium because you're puffed up. And if they're down, you're down and you're supportive, they're designed to lift you up to get you back into equilibrium. Every, everything that's going on in your life is trying to get you authentic and in equilibrium. So what I did when I noticed this, I saw the pattern. I realized it wasn't, she wasn't toxic. Uh, she was doing her job. And I, and I realized that there were other people participating in that same dynamic. And I really stopped, reflected, and looked. And then I did something that was amazing exercise that you might consider. Uh, if I had a big day and I thought, wow, I'm amazing. You know, touch me and you're going to heal kind of thing. And I was puffed up and exaggerating what I'd done and neglecting my appreciation for staff and patients and things. I made a list of things to ask myself. Who did I not remember the name of? What patient did I overlook thanking? What procedure did I overlook today? What staff member did I not thank? You know, whose anniversary or birthday did I overlook? And what I did is I calmed myself down from being puffed up, thinking I was successful, thinking I was amazing. I calmed myself down and then when I, I didn't stop doing that exercise until I got a tear of gratitude for the opportunity to serve people. I noticed when I was grateful for the opportunity to be of service and I was authentically focusing on my mission of service and I went home, my wife was amazingly different. I don't know how to describe it. Go and prove it to yourself. She was more stable because I stabilized myself. See, I'm a firm believer that if you don't govern yourself, the world around you has to. If you don't listen to your physiology and psychology and self-govern, you're going to end up having sociology and theology and family dynamics govern you. So if you're cocky, they're going to bring you down. If you're humble, they're going to lift you up. They're going to just try to get you back into authenticity. So whenever I had a really big day, I calmed myself down. <clears throat> I asked questions of what did I overlook, and I found them. I had been subjectively biased thinking I was successful and I was overlooking the things that I was doing. And I put together a checklist of all the actions that proven to work. And I compared it to the checklist at night on the days I was successful. And I, and I, I, it was like amazing. I thought, oh, I'm successful. But the reality is that I overlooked a lot of stuff. So when I did that exercise and I calmed myself down and I didn't stop until I got a tear of gratitude and I re thought about my mission of service and I drove home. My spouse was present. She wasn't putting me down. She wasn't putting me up. She was just present. And I thought, wow, there's sort of like this non-local dynamic going on in family dynamics and work dynamics. I realized that if I was addicted to praise at work, I get slammed at home. But if I was neutral and I didn't puff myself up and didn't get addicted to praise, I got a loving dynamic at home. She played out the role that whatever I was not willing to embrace at work. I also noticed that if I had a really low day that I would go, well, who did I serve? What patient did I remember the name of? What staff member did I thank? I asked the same questions in reverse and lifted myself up and brought myself into equilibrium with about 35 questions. And I, I took maybe 10 minutes to go through those questions at the end of my day, and I, I centered myself, stabilized myself, and did not stop with those questions until I had a tear of gratitude for the opportunity to be of service and to go back to my mission. So I want you to, to maybe write this down. I don't, when people say to me, you know, when I get interviewed, people say, oh, Dr. DiMartini, you're a success. And I said, well, if that's what you want to label me, I prefer not that label. And they go, they're, they're go, what? 
Why would you not want to be labeled that way? I prefer to be labeled a man on a mission, dedicated to being a service to people. And because I notice that the second I think I'm successful, I usually on my way down. We have this amazing license effect. The second we do something we're proud of. Some of you have done this. You've gone out and you've exercised and you really feel proud of what you've done. You really look fit, you feel tone, etc. And then you give yourself licensing effect that night and you overeat. You eat too much chocolate, you drink too much wine, you overeat food. You gave yourself permission to do something lower in priority that you don't normally give yourself permission the second you thought you succeeded and you felt proud of yourself. And the same thing, if you feel ashamed, you go in the opposite direction. Then you go out and work out and you do things to go in the other direction. This is called the licensing effect. So I found out that the addiction to pride and the subdiction from shame, which is an amygdala response in most human beings, is a survival response avoiding predator seeking prey, avoiding shame seeking you know, pride. And this is not where maximum performance occurs. It's been shown that maximum performance, maximum achievements occur at the border of support and challenge, the border of the pride and shame, the authentic self, which sits in the center. So that's a man on a mission. I'd rather call myself a man on a mission and not label myself successful or failure. I don't like to think of myself. I don't see failure. I see feedback and I don't see negative failure where the feedback is trying to get me to be positive, I also see feedback from the positive to humble me, to get me back down into equilibrium. So I learned, I noticed that the second I get really cocky and really elated, I attract challenging, oh, tragic events to humble me. If you go and look and make a look at all the moments you've had in your life where you've had tragic events, I guarantee you were cocky, elated, manic, puffed up, and excited about something and thinking you're greater than it is. You know, so I'm not here to promote the idea of success. I'm here to promote the idea of a man on a mission or a woman on a mission, living by highest priority, where you're more objective, more neutral, more resilient, more adaptable. See, if the second you think you're successful, you can get addicted to that, you can fear its loss. And many people get depressed when they've had a success and they get a high from it and now they can't get it again and then they feel the loss of it and they feel like a failure because they're addicted to success. And I'm not interested. I have no interest in getting attached to those. As the Buddha says, the desire for that which is unavailable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable, the success and failure illusion is a source of human suffering. So I'm not interested in promoting a one-sided world. I'm not interested in you being optimistic or only positive, only peaceful, only one-sided. Frankly, it's not real and it's not sustainable. And although you may delude yourself into thinking that's going to happen, be honest and take a really good look. I did a very two-year survey of myself and looked at what I actually did and the perceptions I had of myself, and it was humbling. I realized that my idea of success and failure were oscillating states of mind and they were going up and down. And I had a homeostatic mechanism inside my brain to try to keep me centered because it wanted me authentic. And when I'm puffed up and think I'm successful, that's not authentic. When I'm beat up and I'm un and feeling like a failure, that's not authentic. When I'm authentic, I don't attach to those labels. I'm not addicted to one and subdicted from the other, seeking and avoiding. I'm not with impulse and instinct from the amygdala. I'm in the executive center, objective and neutral and resilient and adaptable and I'm focusing on a big vision. See, if you think you're successful, it means you have a small vision and few experiences. And if you have uh, failure, again, you have actually set up a fantasy. And most of the failure se sensations are due to fantasies that had, did not come true. And uh, a lot of people think they have, I mean, I have people come up to me and say, you know, I feel like I have a failed marriage. And I said, why can you have a failed marriage? Did you learn something from it? Well, yeah. And are you now ready to go on and learn from that and go on to the next relationship? Yes. Well, why do you have to label that a failure? And why do you have to label it as success? See, sometimes people have this unrealistic ideal, this moral hypocrisy of one-sidedness that you're supposed to be a certain way. And if it doesn't match that, now you're a failure. And if it does that, you're proud. But you're now cocky and proud if you're one and arrogant if you're one and humbled if you're the other. I'm not interested in those polarities. They're, they're, because anything you infatuate with or anything you resent 
occupy space and time of your mind and runs you. You know, that's one of the reasons I teach the breakthrough experience. I'm, I'm a you know, firm believer that if you go in and take some infatuation in yourself, pride in yourself or, or infatuation with others, and you learn to ask the right questions to neutralize that, they don't run you. But I guarantee you, if you look very carefully, if you're highly infatuated with somebody, they'll occupy space and time of mind. It's hard to sleep at night and you'll end up sacrificing really high value things in your life to be with them. And if you're really cocky and self-righteous in yourself, you'll narcissistically project your values onto others and expect others to live in your values. And both of these are self-defeating. One is an, a narcissistic thing that backfires and the other is an altruistic thing that backfires. We're not here to be narcissistic and expect others to live in our values and try to get something for nothing. We're not here to be altruistic and sacrifice what we're doing for others and then uh, build up resentment. We're here to have sustainable, fair exchange out of equity and equanimity and have a real authentic self. We all want to be loved for who we are, but we're not who we are if we're proud and cocky. And we're not who we are when we're shamed and minimizing ourselves. So the idea of success and failure are labels. They're, they're signs of incomplete awareness about human behavior, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't promote that. But in the breakthrough experience, I teach you how to dissolve the distractions of those two states, the idea of success and failure. Because the second you're so infatuated with success, you're going to fear its opposite. The more you're infatuated with what your success is, and the more you have a fantasy about what it is, and a fantasy is sometimes a one-sided world, you know, positive without negative or, you know, money without work or something, some fantasy, uh, you're going to end up having to fear of failure. And the fear of failure is going to preoccupy your mind, just like the fantasy is going to occupy your mind, and it's going to distract you. I'd rather get focused on my mission. And my mission is to continually refine and educate, in my case, keep educating myself and learning everything I can that can help people do something extraordinary with their life and keep refining the knowledge and organizing the knowledge and disseminating that knowledge in every possible vehicle. And what people label me of success and failure mean very little. I'm, and by the way, other people's opinion of you is not where it's at anyway. If you're sitting there worried about what other people think about you, you're distracted. You always want to compare yourself not to other people. You want to compare your actions to what's highest on your values. That's why in the Breakthrough Experience, I actually help people identify what is it that's really highest on their values. When you live according to your highest values and live congruently with what's most important and prioritize your daily life and fill it with high priority actions, you are more objective, more resilient, more adaptable, more neutral in your perception of yourself, less likely to think you're a success or a failure. But the second you're doing low priority things and you're unfulfilled and you're trying to live in other people's values, you're going to have a moral injected values from other people. This is what Freud called the superego. And the superego then judges you and makes you proud or shamed. And you get into the polarity of success and failure. That's because you're minimizing yourself to somebody else and putting them on a pedestal or exacting yourself and minimizing other people and putting them in a pit. We're not here to judge people. We're here to love people. We're not here to, for success or failure. We're here to serve and sustainable fair exchange where we're actually being compensated fairly for what we do and do that in a way that is inspiring. Some of the people I know that are very high achieving are not cocky. You know, I've, I've met some very powerful people, very wealthy people, very high profile people, many celebrities, many business leaders. Some of them are extremely humble individuals. And if you ask them about their success, they don't even think about it. That's not their focus. They're focused on what they can do tomorrow on their mission. And they're not sitting and going, well, I, I live vicariously through what I achieved in the past. They're on their mission. So that's why I teach people in the breakthrough experience how to prioritize your life, how to determine your values, how to be more objective, how to get in the executive center, how to not let the amygdala run your life, how not to let the labels you give yourself or others interfere with the love that you have for yourself. And then I teach the breakthrough experience, in the breakthrough experience the Demartini method. And this is an absolute gold mine on how to dissolve the emotional baggage, just like I did, you know, if I'm up, what do I do? What, what were the things that I overlooked? And when I'm down, what do I do? If you haven't learned how to, you see, when you're infatuated with somebody, you're blind to the downsides. If you're resentful to somebody, you're blind to the upsides. If you don't ask questions to help you see the downsides when you're infatuated or upsides when you're resentful, you're going to let the infatuation resentment run your life. And if you don't see the downsides of your pride when you're thinking you're successful, 
you're going to let your pride and your so-called success interfere with your achievements because you're going to end up giving your license in effect and you're going to end up devaluing and depurposing your actions and going to lower party actions. I've seen it. I've watched doctors and, and various people when I used to consult in the 80s, a lot of doctors, they retire, they get millions of dollars, they retire and they're on the golf course and they think, okay, now I'm successful. I'm on the golf course. And within months, sometimes a year, they're like going, this is not what I expected. I'm losing my edge. I'm not inspired. I'm not feeling like I'm serving anybody. And they end up going back and doing something more meaningful. So beware of the idea that you're successful. Be grateful for what you're achieving. Be grateful for the opportunity to do it with all the people that help you do it and all the clients that you help to do it. But don't puff yourself up because it's going to, you'll pay a price. I'm not here to, to, uh, to be successful. I'm here to be on a man on a mission. That's why I teach the breakthrough experience to help people center themselves and see both sides of themselves. If you're puffed up and you're blind to your downsides, that's not the authentic you. And if you're beating yourself up and blind to the upsides, not that, that's not the authentic you. You want to be loved for who you are, but you can't be loved for who you are as long as you're being somebody you're not. And that's why I, in the breakthrough experience, I teach people how to love themselves, how to love people around them, how to balance out their perceptions, how to own the traits they see in other people so you're not putting people on pedestals or pits and trying to change you relative to others or others relative to you and labeling yourself success or failure and distracting yourself with these labels that are transient states of emotion instead of long-term visions of achievement. I'd rather just keep going. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I got one more story I want to share. I was uh, speaking, oh gosh, this would have been 1980. No, 1983. 1983, November, I was at the Marriott Marquis in New York. And I was speaking. There's about 5,000 doctors. And there were six speakers. Each was going to speak for 20 minutes. So there's going to be a two hour uh, session. And it was the best ideas to, that can help you serve more people as a doctor. And I was in line. And there was a guy ahead of me named Zev. And he's a lovely guy, very committed guy. His father was a speaker. His father spoke on that convention for many years. And he was standing in front of me and was a bit anxious. And he said to me, turned around to me, he says, you know, this is the day I've been waiting for since I was a child. Since I saw my dad on this stage. I said, so this is the ultimate end for you. And he says, I've, I finally arrived. I'm finally successful. And I thought in my mind, wow, this is interesting. He got up there and I can't say he did the greatest presentation he's ever given. I've seen him do much bigger writer presentation, but he was so uh, elated with the idea. He was anxious and he was enamored with himself and focusing on himself instead of focusing on the audience. If you're a professional speaker and you're thinking about yourself and you're thinking how successful you are, you're going to end up being arrogant and cut down by the client, by the by the people out there that you're speaking to. But if you're humble, they lift you up. I've been, I've been watching that for years. So as he was about to go up on stage, um, I heard him say, you know, I finally arrived. I'm now successful. And in my mind, you know, I was 23, nearly 24 years old. In about a week, I was going to be 20. I mean, pardon me. I was 28. Yeah, 28. And I was about to turn 29. And uh, in my mind, I was thinking, this is not my idea of success. This is just one of a thousand, 10,000 times I'm going to be speaking like this. I envision myself speaking around the world in every country around the world. I've spoken now in 186 la uh, countries. So what I saw when I spoke was not I was a success. I saw that I was a man on a mission with a message. And my presentation went really well. And I know when he came down off the stage, you could see he was distracted because he felt he let himself down. He got puffed up, thought he was successful and got humbled, depurposing. Where I was on a man on a mission and got opportunities to speak further from that very talk that day. I've gone on and now 40 years later, next year, this coming year, 40 years later, I'm still speaking, still doing 300 plus presentations a year. 
So I don't think of myself as success. I think of myself as a man on a mission. So I just want to throw that out on you and let you know that the breakthrough experience and the value determination process, which is in the breakthrough experience, and the demartini method, which is in the breakthrough experience, is a gold mine on how to not let emotions run your life, not let other people's opinions distract you, not let the polarizations of pride or shame interfere with the authentic you. If you would like to be loved for who you are and not have being criticized at home because you're puffed up or, or built up because you're down, because when before I did that exercise in my practice, my, my volatility in my business was quite up and down. I literally was bipolar in my, my feelings. The second I put that in there and I governed myself, people who can't govern themselves get governed by other people. If you're not empowering your life, other people overpower you. And when I governed myself, my practice was steady. So if you'd like to grow a more stable life, more stable business, more stable relationship, learn the arts of living by priority and learn how to do the Demartini method to clear the baggage that distracts you. The moment you think your success or failure, pride or shame, putting people on pedestals or pits and put them all in your heart. When you put people in your heart and you live from your heart, you're going to have way more fulfillment in life. And I assure you, you're going to get more done. I've met a lot of people. I, I met a secretary of defense here this week who spoke here on the ship. And he is one sharp cookie from the United States. One sharp dude. And um, I asked him how he started. He said, well, I was in Michigan. I was in school and I was studying Russian and I wanted to work for the government. And I wrote it down and I had a vision that I would work for the president someday. And, and he had a really clear vision. He said, I was so graced by the opportunity of serving people on both ends and negotiating and helping people in conflicts and issues. He says, I, I get to do that every day of my life. And it is such a, such an inspiration to do what I do. And I said, and I, if you read his, his accolades, you go, this is a very highly honored accoladed individual, but he doesn't think himself as successful. He sees himself as a man on a mission. And since he was young, so very humble guy, lovely guy, so I just want to make sure I shared that I with you, that idea with you. Come to the breakthrough experience. Let me train you on how to live by priority. Let me train you on how to get into the executive center where you're self-governed, where you're authentic. The very high medial prefrontal cortex, the executive center of the brain, is now, according to Scientific American in September, October, they've been described it as the seat of the true self. Go read about it. It's interesting. And... Uh, I, uh, I've known that for years, but it was absolutely amazing to finally see a real scientific journal talking about that. It's the integration of ourself. And so the second we live by priority, that occurs. And when we do, we are least volatile, most stable, most centered, most focused, most prioritized, most engaged, most productive, most achieving without the labels. And the second you start to get labels, if you don't know how to manage those polarities and bring those back into equilibrium, they come to the breakthrough experience. Let me show you how to do that. It's a gold mine because then you're not letting the external world run you. You know, what's interesting is it's, it's not the external world that determines our destiny. We have control over our perception, decisions, and actions. You know, I was reading another article in Scientific American, this December issue right now, and uh, it was talking about moral injury. And it was a group of people that were wounded, in my opinion, by fantasies about how life is supposed to be. And then they're not living up to that fantasy and they're self-depreciating and sometimes suicidal. And they don't realize that they're not in their executive center. They've subordinated to outer authorities. They're living in their amygdala because of the unfulfillment and they're striving for fantasies and of immediate gratification and trying to be one-sided. Anytime you try to be one-sided, you're automatically guaranteed to self-defeat. So if you want to think that success is all positive, you're going to end up with failure that's going to give you negativities. I'm not interested in those labels. In the breakthrough experience, I shatter those. I break those myths. I broke those 38 years ago. I've, I've not ever gone back to those myths. It is as direct, the Nobel Prize winner said, it's not that we don't know so much. We know so much that isn't so. We're taught so much misinformation about mastering our life. I've spent 50 years of my life working on how to master your life, how to achieve what it is you want to achieve. 
and not putting yourself on pedestals or pits, but actually being authentic, opening your heart and being grateful for your life on a daily basis. To me, that's what matters. You know, I was, I was talking to a group of doctors one time and I said, um, one of the signs of your achievement is not just how much income you made. That's one. You can measure that. That's fine. It's a metric, the harm. But it's how many people wanted to follow your footsteps and, and go into the profession that you've done because you inspired them. Yeah. Because when you're doing something you're really inspired by and you're on a mission, there's something about you that's different. You're not arrogant, puffed up. You're just focused. So that's my message today. Go sign up for the Breakthrough Experience. I'm absolutely certain. I've taught that program 1,165 times. I'm absolutely certain what you're going to learn in there is going to be something deeply meaningful. It's, it's a trajectory changer. I ask people at the end of the program every week, how many of you learned something this week? You could have gone your entire life, and if you hadn't have been here, you would never have learned it. Every hand goes up. I am certain that will happen because I've got a 100% track record of that for all these years, 34 years. So if you'd like to go and spend 25 hours or 24 hours with me, you spent 30 minutes with me here. If you want to spend about 24, 4, 25 hours with me and go explore the laws of, of human mastery and develop your mastery of life, your authenticity, I'll teach you how to go beyond success and how to have a fulfillment life, an authentic life. The magnificence of who you are is far greater than any fantasies you'll ever have on yourself. Don't get caught in a success fantasy. You'll self-defeat. I think that had an impact on Robin Williams and many other people. Many people who think they're successful usually come and crumble down. You'll see that in the biographies of many successful people. They got cocky and they overdid things and they thought they were invincible and they humbled. I'm not interested in that. The magnificence of who you really are, an authentic state with a tear in your eye, living by priority and dissolving the emotions that distract you is a way more profound state. So go and sign up for the Breakthrough Experience. I assure you you're going to learn something you're not going to learn anywhere else. And I assure you you can't hang out with me for 24, 25 hours without having something happen. So just join me. I, I assure you that you're going to have a, you're going to say thank you at the end. But by the way, if you come, don't think it's in the spectator game. Don't sit there and just go, I want to go rah, rah and, you know, stand up on chairs and go rah, rah. That's not what I'm going to be doing. We're going to explore how human behavior works. We're going to teach you the principles and methods and the action steps on how to achieve. But I'm not going to give you fantasies. I'm not going to just sell you fantasies and make you feel good. I don't find that those are transient things that are just marketing gimmicks. I'm interested in the real material that actually is something you can stand on it. So 20 years from now, you'll be able to take that information and still stand on it. So come, see if it's not what I just said true. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, just contemplate what I said out of this. But I, I just love sharing an idea that just might make a difference in your life. And hopefully this one did. So I'll see you at the Breakthrough Experience and um, have a fantastic week and see you this coming week too. Okay, love y'all.